Hello, and welcome to the second in a series of briefings we're holding to help build better understanding in Congress on the impacts and harms of carbon capture and hydrogen infrastructure. This briefing is co-hosted by the Center for International Environmental Law, Food and Water Watch, Friends of the Earth, Oil Change International, the Indigenous Environmental Network, Institute for Policy Studies Climate Policy Program, and the Science and Environmental Health Network. We're holding this series largely because Congress is enabling the expansion of carbon capture and hydrogen infrastructure, particularly because of billions in federal funding in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as well as continuing efforts to, eat, to add even more funding for fossil fuel subsidies for industry-backed climate scams in the Manchin-led bipartisan energy push, as well as the potential for inclusion in a reconciliation package. There are also efforts in the administration to fast track the permitting of CO2 pipelines and injection wells. It's very important that Congress rejects these attempts to fund and fast track the infrastructure, and we hope these series will help give you the tools and knowledge to help do that. In the series, we'll discuss plans the fossil fuel industry and big agricultural interests are pushing for ma a massive nationwide build out of cap carbon capture infrastructure. Today's briefing will provide a deeper dive into the significant harms and public health and environmental justice impacts of carbon capture infrastructure. These harms can be overlooked as we uh, are seeking solutions to the climate crisis, and it's important that they be taken into consideration. We need to make sure that the solutions we're seeking will not make things worse, which CCS does in a number of ways that we'll discuss today. These harms are made possible largely due to these federal subsidies, and these existing subsidies are stopping these subsidies are critical to stopping the harms and further extract, I'm sorry, and further um, extension of these tax credits will only serve to create greater harms to the public health and environmental justice. I will introduce our speakers before we begin, um, but before that, we've received some questions from the audience that we will be uh, addressing um, uh, from our speakers, uh, from those who registered. But if there are other questions that come up during the briefing, you can ask those uh, by using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And we'll work to get to as many people's questions as possible. We are recording this briefing and sharing it following the presentation as well as handouts the speakers have provided for the briefing. I'm Jim Walsh, I'm the Policy Director for Food and Water Watch. I'm honored to moderate this panel on public health and environmental justice harms of carbon capture infrastructure that the fossil fuel industry is pushing across the country. I'm joined today um, by uh, Ms. Martinez. Naomi Martinez is Director of the Central California Environmental Justice Network. Prior to joining this network, Ms. Martinez worked for the Madera County Public Health Project Department as a health education coordinator and for 10 years was the health projects coordinator for the Binational Center for the Development of Ox Okokan uh, Indigenous Communities. Ms. Martinez has vast experience working with immigrants and residents of disadvantaged communities across the San Joaquin Valley and serves on various advisory groups, including the Environmental Justice Advisory Group for the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. We're also joined by Stephen Fite, who's the attorney in CL's, uh, the Center for International Environmental Law's Climate and Energy Program. Stephen works, his focus is primarily on climate liability and finance. He specializes in developing legal strategies to hold the fossil fuel companies accountable for impacts of climate change and failures to acknowledge climate risks. Stephen graduated from Cornell University with a BS in Applied Economics and Management, and then attended law school at New York University. At NYU, he serves as the editor of the Environmental Law Journal and worked for multiple environmental nonprofits. Sakawis uh, Nobis is Plain Cree, uh, Cree Salto of the George Gordon First Nation Saskatchewan, Canada, in Saskatchewan, Canada, and grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba. At 19, her life uh, work and uplifting Indigenous voices began when she got her first job in the New Brunswick Aboriginal People's Council in Fredericton, Canada. In 2015, she founded the Great Plains Action Society as a way to increase Indigenous solidarity in Iowa City and is also a prominent speaker, writer, and artist. Dr. Ted Shetler is a science director of the Science and Environmental Health Network. He is also a science advisor to Healthcare Without Harm, an organization seeking to reduce adverse public health environmental impacts of the healthcare institutions. He has a medical degree from Case Western Reserve University and a master's degree in public health from Harvard. 
He was a co-author of several papers on the impacts of environmental toxins in public health and serves an advisory committee of the US EPA and the National Academy of Sciences. Sandra Steingraber uh, is also joining us today. Um, she and Dr. Steingraber is a public health biologist and co-founder of Concerned Health Professionals New York. She serves as a senior scientist at the Science Environmental Health Network. She is a frequent writer and lecturer on environmental factors that contribute to reproductive health problems and environmental links to cancer. Dr. Steingraber has been on the faculty of Cornell University and is a distinguished visiting scholar at the Division of Interdisciplinary and International Studies at Ithaca College. She has also held visiting fellowships at the University of Illinois, Radcliffe, Harvard, and Northeastern University, and served on President Clinton's National Action Plan on Breast Cancer. We will now hear from uh, our speakers. Uh, first, we'll hear from Stephen Fate from the Center for International Law, who will discuss the pollutants and co-pollutants from carbon capture. Stephen, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, as Jim mentioned, my name is Stephen Feit. I'm an attorney uh, in the climate program at the Center for International Environmental Law. And today I wanna quickly go over the severe and detrimental pollution impacts of uh, carbon capture and storage. Next slide, please. So I just wanna set the baseline. I know this is something we all know, but it's really worth reiterating. that pollution is deadly. It is profoundly destructive to human health. A study uh, coming out of Harvard last year found that fossil fuel air pollution was responsible for more than uh, 8 million deaths, one out of five deaths in the year 2018. It is a profound, profound source of harm. Uh, next slide, please. This applies not just globally, but also in the US, a study that just came out recently from uh, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, found that uh, removing fossil fuel combustion emission sources could prevent more than 50,000 premature deaths each year. So we are talking about an enormous, enormous public health burden uh, from, from burning things, primarily fossil fuels, but also biomass, plastics, and increasingly wildfires. Um, these pollutants are a, uh, and I've already said this several times, but I really can't reiterate this enough, a profound public health threat. And so what does this have to do with CCS? Next slide, please. Carbon capture itself is a dirty and extremely energy intensive process. From the IPCC's most recent report, uh, the energy penalty for CCS increases the fuel requirement for electricity generation by 13 to 44%. Essentially, to do carbon capture, you have to use a lot of energy. It, you have to spray amine solvents and regenerate them. It requires a lot of electricity and heat. And it increases, to get the same amount of energy out of a given system, increases the fuel requirements usually by about 20 to 30%. This is referred to as the energy penalty for CCS. And that energy penalty means more fuel consumption and combustion on site and therefore more emissions. And so what I want to walk through now um, are the impacts of those that additional energy consumption. And what I want to do is use three permit applications or permits as case studies. So to, um, to get a permit under you know, the Clean Air Act, um, uh, companies have to do best available control technology analyses, analyses for certain pollutants, including greenhouse gases, which means that they have to evaluate the pollution abatement potential, particularly of CCS. And you can see what they say about that. Next slide, please. So this first is an excerpt from a Chevron Phillips chemical uh, permit application for a steam cracker in the Gulf Coast. Uh, carbon capture would require an energy penalty of approximately 30%. And for the cracker project, this energy penalty would result in generation of not only 30% more greenhouse gases to generate the required steam energy to operate the plant, but also would increase emissions of NOx, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds, PM10, SO2, and ammonia by an equivalent percentage. 
we're talking about an enormous increase in the pollutant load from the carbon capture facility itself. Because again, carbon capture is not just it's not just this little attachment. What we're essentially talking about when we're talking about carbon capture is building a chemical facility and a power plant next to or, or attached to the original underlying facility. Uh, next slide, please. This is a permit application from St. James Methanol, um, noting that the increase in energy required to process the CO2 would be costly and greatly increase emissions of combustion pollutants such as PM, NOx, CO, SO2, VOC, and hazardous air pollutants such as acetaldehyde. It is questionable whether a system size large enough to capture the CO2 emissions would pass Louisiana ambient air standards. That's the scale of the additional pollution impact that we're talking about when we're talking about carbon capture systems, that it threatens the ability of the system to meet ambient air quality standards. Next slide, please. And the final one, this is actually from a preliminary determination summary, so the permit, not the permit application, on a monoethylene glycol plant, also in Louisiana, which talks about not only does generation of this electricity result in significant criteria pollutant emissions, but there's another source of toxic exposure from the carbon capture process. Amine-based scrubbing. This is, this is the, the most well-developed kind of carbon capture um, where you use a solution that's similar to ammonia uh, to absorb the CO2 and then you have to regenerate it. Amine-based scrubbing generates large volumes of wastewater, which would have to be treated and discharged to a nearby water body and solid waste, which eventually must be disposed in a landfill. Next slide, please. So that's the emissions from the capture process itself. Um, the, it, because you have to consume a lot more energy, it creates a lot more in terms of um, criteria pollutant and hazardous air pollutant emissions, and it creates liquid and solid wastes. But the CO2 itself also has to go somewhere. And if it's being utilized, there's no commercial market for CO2 except enhanced oil recovery. Uh, more than 95% of CCS capacity in the US has been used for DOR. There are proposals to use carbon dioxide in chemical and plastics production, in which case it would then continue its toxic legacy beyond the capture phase, which itself is already extremely toxic. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, we know that the pollutant burden born uh, is, is borne by everyone, but not equally, and that communities of color and low-income communities are already uh, profoundly disproportionately exposed to pollution. In the same report, the IPCC notes uh, the, the importance of clustering for both industrial activity and CCS. Because of the presence of several industrial clusters globally, a number of regions demonstrate locations where CO2 utilization potential could be matched with large point sources of CO2. Essentially what this means is that the already environmentally unjust clusters of industrial and, and um, pollutant sources are the places they're looking to put the most carbon capture, which threatens to redouble and intensify already existing environmental injustice. The upshot of all of this is that carbon capture is extremely chemical and energy intensive. The capture process itself produces new pollution, but it's fundamentally parasitic on underlying emitting facilities. So a CCS build-out threatens to inundate fence line communities with even more pollution and exacerbate already existing environmental injustice. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen, for um, uh, sharing that information. I think it's um, you know, really important to recognize that when the fossil fuel industry talks about carbon capture, it's not this narrow frame uh, that, that just involves the one smokestack, but there are other uh, sorts of dynamics at play that can also create additional uh, pollution. And it's not just the CO2, it's other harmful emissions as well. So thank you so much. Um, next, we're gonna hear from uh, Sakawis uh, Nobis um, from the Great Plains Action Society. Um, Sakawis, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me here today uh, to speak about the indigenous work and perspectives on CCS 
Um, I'm going to talk about a few points, um, the missing and murdered Indigenous relatives crisis, lack of informed uh, consultation, uh, tribal emergency response, environmental racism, and economics. Um, the relentless colonization of our territories on Turtle Island has a direct correlation to an increased rate of violence against Indigenous women, men, Two-Spirit people, and children, uh, in particular women, children, and Two-Spirit folks. Uh, we have many names for this crisis, one of which is missing and murdered uh, relatives, also uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Uh, today, I take this opportunity to call attention to the effect that temporary workforce housing, also known as man camps for large construction projects, fossil fuel, and other resource extraction or mineral mining projects has on Indigenous communities uh, situated nearby. As James Anaya, former UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, has stated, Indigenous women have reported that the influx of workers into Indigenous communities as a result of extractive projects also led to increased incidents of sexual harassment and violence, including rape and assault. There are many statistics um, on uh, this phenomenon, but I'm going to share with you just one area where this uh, where studies have been done. And this is um, um, North Dakota, uh, which is where actually um, these uh, pipelines will be leading. Um, on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, located in the middle of the Bakken oil fields, there was a 70% increase of federal case filings between 2009 and 2011. Uh, according to a new report released in 2017, there is a correlation between an increase in violence and the oil boom. The report states that since the Bakken oil boom, Native American communities have reported increased states rates of human trafficking, uh, specifically sex trafficking and missing and murdered Indigenous women in their communities. Now, the corridor between Sioux Falls and Omaha is a dangerous space already for Indigenous peoples, and that's something that Great Plains Action Society is actively working on right now. We're actually working with a coalition of, of folks across North Dakota, sorry, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa about um, the rate of sex trafficking in this area. We have um, the, 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 in Omaha, um, the, uh, this city is uh, number eight in the nation for missing and murdered uh, Indigenous women. Uh, and Nebraska itself is number seven in the nation for missing and murdered Indigenous women. So we already have an issue here. Um, and in Sioux City, we uh, have a Indigenous uh, population of 2%, but the houseless population, uh, they make up, uh, Indigenous peoples make up 45 to 63% of the houseless population. Um, and this is an area where these uh, companies are going to bring uh, thousands of transient workers uh, into man camps, which will, again, greatly increase the violence in our tribal areas. Uh, we have proof of this behavior during the Iowa uh, Dakota Access Pipeline fight when a transient worker asked uh, how much for the little girl to an Indigenous family during a protest. Um, next, I'll talk about lack of informed uh, consultation. Um, Great Plains Action Society started to contact local tribes through the TIPOs, the uh, Tribal Historical Preservation Officers in Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota. Through this, we found that none of the tribes had received free prior and informed consent yet about these projects, either from the companies or the federal or state governments. And this is upsetting because the states had already been in conversation with these companies for a very long time. Through our advocacy to increase awareness with the tribes, the Winnebago tribe set up a session with Summit. In this meeting, Summit did not even know where the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska's reservation was located on Summit's own map that they provided for the meeting. What does this tell us? That again, the US government is allowing corporate profiteers to trample the rights of sovereign tribal nations and the inherent rights of indigenous peoples as outlined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And this is happening up and down the corridor. This is happening to other tribes as well. Next is tribal emergency response. Uh, there is currently a complete utter lack of infrastructure and equipment in case of an emergency. Are these companies and the government going to outfit the tribes with what they need to respond to a disaster should it occur? We know that none of these tribes are prepared for this. We know that these pipelines are also prone to malfunction, just like anything else mechanical. Mechanical things break down. It's not a question of if, but when. Will they provide us with oxygen tanks, electric emergency vehicles, and proper training in case of an emergency? Everyone along the route is going to be a guinea pig for unproven, untested technology that has already proven dangerous. See Satarsia, which will be talked about here, I'm sure. Uh, and of course, there is a huge historical distrust on our part about this, as we have been guinea pigs to so many unethical US-backed projects. 
Uh, and next, I want to speak about environmental racism. Navigator and Summit will traverse parts of the Dakota Access Pipeline easement corridor, which of course is an insult to the global movement that stood for the safety and sovereignty of the Standing Rock tribe since 2014. What about sacred sites? And again, will there be a lack of an environmental impact study or statement? Uh, what about the urban centers that are filled with BIPOC folks that are not being consulted about this? I know that Fort Dodge uh, has an area, a low-lying area that um, is a, a Black community. They have not been consulted about this. If the pipeline that goes by there leaks, it's going to settle in that area. And I've been working to um, uplift this issue in that area. Um, where, the, where will this CO2 eventually be stored? Because of right now, white communities in the Bismarck area are heavily against having it piped through or stored there. And just like so many other instances, will this again be rerouted into Indigenous territories if white communities say no? Right now, where this um, uh, project, uh, the summit project is slated to end, uh, there is an affluent housing development being uh, proposed in this area. I don't think that it's going to be stored there if these folks say no, let's just be honest about that. Uh, we already have a carbon capture me mechanism that is tried and true and has been practiced for time immemorial here on the plains and it is called the prairie. One acre of pristine prairie can store up to five tons of carbon. If we planted back 20 million acres of tall grass prairie properly stewarded by the Buffalo and indigenous people, we could store 100 million tons of carbon. And as Vine Deloria has said, sacred sites go from the middle of the earth to infinity. And so the, we must understand that below the earth is very important to us as well as indigenous peoples. Many of our creation stories come from the world below and we have a great regard for that biome. And in the end, we need to listen to the legitimate historical narratives and the traditional ecological knowledge that has always been proven right in the fight to keep this world safe. Basically the resounding cry is and will be, don't do this. Do not harm the world below. Do not harm what is properly there and doing good for all of us and everything else is going to be affected because of it. Lastly, economics. How will tribal nations benefit from these pipelines going through their unceded and reservation territories long-term? They will of course receive a paltry sum of money, which, you know, is uh, historically accurate, uh, but in that minor economic incentive, is that minor economic incentive worth the risk to the health and safety of their people, uh, land, and water? Thank you. Thank you very much, Takawis. I appreciate that your time sharing this with us. It's um, you know really uh, just kind of almost sad to hear about the the lack of of respect and concern that these companies have for indigenous rights and indigenous communities. And uh, I appreciate you taking time to to share those um, you know those impacts that um, I think you know happen with these projects and you know that are that people generally don't think about when uh, these developments happen and so thank you very much hopefully there's folks in the audience who can help to make sure that those concerns are, are addressed as we move forward in this discussion so thank you um, next um, we will hear from dr uh, ted shetler um, who will discuss the health impacts of co2 including some of the challenges that first responders uh, face in this so, uh, uh, dr shetler i'll turn it over to you thank you so much for Thank you, Jim. Uh, thanks for the invitation, the opportunity to speak to, with you today. I'm Ted Shetler. I'm the science director of the Science and Environmental Health Network. And I'm going to speak about some of the hazards and risks of exposures to concentrated levels of carbon dioxide. Next slide, please. When carbon dioxide is captured from an industrial facility, like for example, from a facility that's making ethanol, by fermenting corn, that carbon dioxide is wet and it needs to be dehydrated before it can be compressed and put into a pipeline for transport. This is because when water and uh, carbon dioxide combine, they form carbonic acid, which is highly corrosive in carbon steel uh, pipelines. If the carbon dioxide is captured from a fossil fuel combustion facility, it must also be separated from the other contaminants in the uh, flue gas that uh, Stephen described earlier because they can also be corrosive to carbon, uh, carbon steel pipelines. The uh, purified CO2 then is compressed at high pressure into what's called a supercritical liquid for transport uh, through the pipe. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So let's talk a little bit about carbon dioxide, the gas. It's colorless, odorless, non-flammable, and heavier than air. Uh, those are important characteristics to keep in mind as we go through this discussion. It's classified as a hazardous substance by both the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, as well as the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH. And uh, the reasons for that will become clear in a few minutes. Uh, both OSHA and NIOSH have developed uh, either permissible or recommended airborne exposure levels, which uh, pertain primarily to the workplace. That's because there are some occupations where exposure to slightly elevated uh, levels of carbon dioxide can occur, such as in mines or uh, refrigerated uh, uh, carb, uh, um, dry ice refrigeration units or in fermenting facilities, that, for example, that make uh, the ethanol or other forms of alcohol. Um, and you can see here what the, what the exposure limits are uh, according to OSHA and NIOSH, but I wanna point out that NIOSH says that the exposure should not exceed 3% carbon dioxide over any 15 minute period. And I'll come back to that uh, in just a minute or two. Next slide, please. Now, if a CO2 pipeline leaks or ruptures, the CO2 will be released uh, as a mixture of very cold gas and fine solid particles. Uh, this can be an explosive uh, release because as I mentioned, the CO2 is at high pressure within the pipeline in a supercritical phase. And when the pressure is dropped because of a leak or a rupture, the, uh, the liquid CO2 immediately turns to a very cold gas that can cause the uh, pipeline to become brittle and uh, fracture even more. The CO2 cloud that's released moves driven both by wind and by its own weight over the terrain, uh, and it gathers at low points and in valleys, uh, displacing the ambient air. And this is what Sakawa was just referring to when she mentioned a place in the uh, area of North Dakota where the, the terrain uh, is it, where it's low and where CO2 would collect if it were uh, to, to uh, be released in that area. Because it displaces the ambient air, it causes a danger of asphyxiation uh, in addition to other kinds of toxicity to any uh, uh, person or animal that might be in the, in the uh, dis vicinity of the dispersing cloud. It also causes a failure of inter internal combustion engines in cars, trucks, and rescue vehicles because it's driven the oxygen away. And this actually happened in rescue vehicles that were dispatched after the release of uh, carbon dioxide in Satarsha, Mississippi, uh, so-called Satarsha incident, where people weren't sure exactly what was happening, except that there were a lot of people who were affected and suddenly ill, and the ambulance responders came and found that their ambulances wouldn't run because they were internal combustion engines. This also means that first responders will need an independent air supply because they would not be effective at all if they simply went in into this uh, dispersing cloud uh, without uh, additional sources of oxygen. Next slide, please. Now, this diagram is just sort of a graphic depiction of, of, of a CO2 cloud being released from a pipeline. And you can begin to see the variables that will influence the dispersion of this cloud. For example, uh, the pipe diameter will influence how much is released. The design of the pipe will have an influence whether or not there are so-called crack arresters that are uh, placed uh, inter at intervals along the pipeline because of the tendency of the pipe to rupture longitudinally. The pressure of the supercritical liquid will influence the size and dispersion of this uh, cloud. Whether or not the pipeline is covered with soil will have an effect. The direct and, and direction and dimensions of the rupture will influence its, its dispersal. And then the distance between shutoff valves and the response time by people who are supposed to be monitoring these pipelines and detect a pressure drop when immediately after it recurs. And then of course, the topography and wind speed and direction will all have an influence. The point of this is that modeling exercises that have tried to figure out the uh, extent to which a cloud with dangerous levels of CO2 would disperse are wildly variable depending upon the assumptions that you build uh, 
into the into the model. So some of them would predict a uh, dangerous concentration of CO2 over a distance of only several hundred meters, while other modeling exercises predict a dangerous concentration extending out to a number of kilometers. It all depends on some of these variables. Next slide, please. Now, CO2 is produced as a product of our normal metabolic processes internally. Uh, and the CO2 that's generated is then uh, transported through our bloodstream where it's exhaled through our uh, breath of our lungs or in uh, our urine as bicarbonate. Uh, and these levels of CO2 in the blood are very tightly regulated. Uh, these levels play a major role in regulating both the tissue and blood uh, acid base balance or pH. And as I've mentioned, when carbon dioxide and water interact, they form carbonic acid. And that happens not only in a pipeline, but it also happens in our blood. So when our levels of CO2 begin to go up, uh, our blood begins to acidify. We develop what's called acidosis. And there is a rapid response to that, which is largely determined by so-called chemoreceptors, which are located in both the carotid arteries in our neck, as well as in a, the base of our brain, that detect changes in the blood pH and detect changes in the blood CO2 levels and alter our breathing patterns. And so if the CO2 levels begin to rise in our blood, we begin to breathe more rapidly uh, in an attempt to lower the uh, CO2 levels by exhaling it. And it's essential that the blood pH uh, remain within a narrow range for the normal functioning of virtually all organs and physiologic systems. Next slide, please. So let me just talk uh, briefly about some of the health impacts of a rising CO2 level. And on this chart, I've put the concentrations of CO2 over on the left. So for example, you see here that a 2% concentration in the air that we're breathing uh, is detected uh, quite quickly by our respiratory center that I've mentioned, and we begin to breathe more rapidly. The, the chemoreceptors have detected the increase in CO2, and uh, in an attempt to keep our blood pH normal, uh, we begin to be, breathe uh, more rapidly and more deeply. If the, blood, if the concentration of CO2 in the air that we're breathing goes up to just 4%, uh, we now really begin to develop the respiratory acidosis that I mentioned. Our breathing rate isn't really able to uh, keep up with it. And this level is immediately dangerous to life and health, according to NIOSH, because it not only causes acidosis, but it also causes confusion, make, making it difficult for people to remove themselves from the area. And then you can see as the concentrations begin to go up, we, for example, at 10% uh, uh, unconsciousness within a few minutes and at 20% death within a minute. So you can begin to see how the characteristics of CO2, uh, odorless, invisible, heavier than air with these toxic properties represent a real hazard and raise questions about setbacks from homes and communities and how we should think about uh, uh, rooting these pipelines. Thank you very much. That's all I have now. Thank you so much, Ted. You know, I, I think that oftentimes it's easy to think about uh, CO2 as a very benign and harmless uh, in, uh, uh, chemical. And, um, you know, it's in our sodas, it's, it's it helps the plants grow, but really um, can pose a serious public health uh, threat as you shared there. So thank you so much for, for highlighting that point. Um, next, we have another uh, brilliant uh, academic with us, um, Dr. Steinger Steingraber. Um, uh, we'll turn it over to you to talk uh, more about the health effects of prolonging the fossil fuel industry. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Steingraber. My pleasure, Jim. Thank you, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Sandra Steingraber. I'm a PhD biologist, and together with Dr. Ted Shetler, I serve as the senior scientist at the Science and Environmental Health Network, where we've been intensely studying carbon capture and storage technology. I've recently written about the ecology of carbon capture practices in this 
um, kind of giant report, <laughs> the Compendium of Scientific Medical and Media Findings uh, demonstrating the risks and harms of fracking and associated uh, gas and oil infrastructure. So I'm gonna share some of the findings with you. Um, but first, and by way of introduction, I'd like to remind us all of a mid-century, mid-20th century cartoonist named Rube Goldberg. Goldberg was the creator of an iconic cartoon character named Professor Butts, a fanciful and foolish inventor of convoluted devices uh, designed to carry out simple tasks by the most outlandish means possible. So for example, the self-operating napkin featured the professor wearing a contraption that wipes his mustache after slurping soup by a string attached to the spoon, which pulls a ladle that tosses a cracker to a parrot who tips a bucket that ignites a lighter that sets off a rocket that cuts a string that frees a pendulum that swings back and forth with a napkin attached to it and so wipes his mustache. A Rube Goldberg machine then went on to become known as um, something, so any process that's sort of intentionally designed to do something in the most ridiculous and unworkable way possible. And lost to history, um, I think because of the comedy nature of the cartoons, was the more existential meanings of, of Goldberg's drawings. Um, Goldberg, as a political cartoonist, was in fact deeply concerned about the runaway rise of fascism in the 1930s and the failure of political leadership to contain it. And then later during the Cold War, um, he intended his drawings to serve as a satirical warning about the runaway escalation of the nuclear arms race. So we're now well into the uh, 21st century and we face another existential threat, the unstoppable chain reaction of runaway climate change that's being driven by the combustion of fossil fuels, which is loading up our atmosphere with um, two heat trapping gases, carbon dioxide and its vaporous sibling uh, methane. And world scientists are clear that we have a terrifyingly short time frame to stop burning fossil fuels altogether. Um, and even more immediately, we need to stop building any new fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, carbon capture and storage, dis storage does not help us meet either of those goals. Uh, indeed, CCS is best understood as a Rube Goldberg machine that distracts and delays us from those necessary tasks through an expensive and ridiculously complicated system that masquerades as a climate solution, but actually functions to keep the whole fossil fuel party going long after uh, the curfew that science says is necessary. And carbon capture and storage, um, you've, you've heard it described um, very uh, eloquently by previous speakers. Here's how I talk about it. Instead of retiring a coal plant, for example, and replacing it with renewable energy, we instead attach this coal plant smokestack up to some complicated machinery that is powered by a gas-fired turbine to catch some of the carbon dioxide, which would otherwise be released into the atmosphere from fossil fuel combustion, separate it from other emissions, allow those other emissions to be released, pressurize the CO2 into a liquid, and then transport the liquefied carbon dioxide through pipelines, most typically to oil fields, where that captured carbon dioxide is then injected into depleted oil wells to help loosen drops of remaining oil that would have otherwise stayed in the ground and then once extracted, of course, that oil is burned. So I want to say that last part again. Um, at least 80%, um, maybe more, of carbon capture and storage as it's currently practiced is used to get more oil out of the ground. And indeed, car carbon capture and storage is a technology that was actually invented by the oil industry a half century ago for that very purpose. Um, in other words, the sole purpose was to get more oil out of the earth, not prevent more CO2 from going into the atmosphere. And the name for this, as you've heard, is enhanced oil recovery. And the only thing new about enhanced oil recovery um, is uh, dressing it up in a green costume and marketing it as a climate solution and then getting taxpayers to subsidize it. And I think that origin story helps us understand why CCS has largely failed to reach its promised race of capture. And the, the failure of it to actually work as promised is, um, is uh, it's really stunning. Um, claims that CCS can reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 90% have never been realized. Um, with pilot projects actually capturing as little as 30%. There is no commercial scale projects currently operating for utilities, none. Indeed, carbon capture and storage has largely failed for coal-fired power plants. 
um, the flagship demonstration project that was supposed to showcase CCS uh, was Chevron's $54 billion Gorgon LNG plant in Western Australia. And that facility has been plagued with technical problems. It was only operating at half capacity at the end of uh, 2021. And it's only buried a third of the carbon dioxide it's generated since uh, 2016, which is very far, obviously, from 90 some percent. Um, and here in the United States, the sole utility scale CCS project is the Petronova coal fired plant in Texas that shut down in 2020 after oil prices crashed because again, Petronova pumped its captured carbon dioxide to the Permian Basin to assist in oil extraction operations. And, and those operations were largely suspended during the lockdowns of the pandemic. So to speak a little briefly about science, um, a 2020 review of more than 200 papers on carbon capturing technology published in scientific journals concluded that the failures of, of carbon capture and storage are systemic and they are irremediable um, because it can never store more than it captures. Point source carbon, uh, carbon capture and storage is not a negative emissions uh, strategy and it can't significantly reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide. In, indeed, as currently practiced, uh, carbon capture and storage is net additive, releasing into the atmosphere more carbon dioxide than it actually removes. More recently, a 2021 study found that equipping a coal plant with carbon capture technology would, over a 20-year period, result in only a 10% reduction in carbon dioxide entering the atmosphere compared to a coal plant operating without CCS. And further, the carbon capture and storage technology itself, as you've heard, is itself a source of greenhouse gas emissions, which are unaccounted for in most um, assessments. Because a powering this equipment is energy intensive, carbon capture and storage makes local air pollution worse. Uh, and this is, as you've heard, an environmental justice issue because these facilities are located in low income and in communities of color and indigenous communities. The emissions from the gas turbine that powers the capture equipment itself is not captured, nor are the methane leaks uh, from the gas turbine that power the capture equipment, um, nor are the upstream methane needed to run um, the machine that is fracked out of the ground. Um, carbon capture and storage requires 10 to 20% of a power plant's output just to run the capturing machinery. Um, and therefore, any uh, power plant that's equipped with carbon capture and storage technology, such as a gas-fired power plant or a coal plant, will have to consume more power and generate more air pollution just to generate the same amount of electricity that it did without that technology. And that means more smog and more soot um, and, and more hazardous vapors will be going into environmental justice communities where these facilities are located. Unlike carbon dioxide, these additional co-pollutants are not collected and captured, um, and they put, pose additional health risks to those local residents. The total social cost, which means equipment plus public health plus the climate cost of a coal plant outfitted with gas-fired carbon capture and storage equipment is over twice more than double that of wind replacing coal directly. And that, is how the mustache of the fossil fuel industry <laughs> is wiped um, using carbon capture and storage technology paid for by our tax dollars to keep that industry slurping soup at our collective table. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Steingraber. I, I greatly appreciate the <laughs> just get the way that you're able to pull back the the you know, kind of myths that the fossil fuel industry talks about this and really highlight the fact that, you know, this is really an expensive, complicated distraction uh, that's very expensive uh, uh, in, in general and that, that um, you know, that, that we need to stop uh, following the fossil fuel industry and to make another kind of analogy. It's like, you know, this industry has been lying to the public for, for decades. And, um, you know, it's like Lucy pulling the football away from Charlie Brown and, and will Congress continue to go up and punt this football um, or will they actually 
start acting to really put forward real policies that are going to keep fossil fuels in the ground and replace them with clean renewable energy. And so thank you very much for, for sharing that. Um, next, um, we're going to turn it over to uh, Naeem and uh, Martinez, who um, is going to discuss the direct environmental harms um, from carbon capture projects that are threatening her community um, specifically. So Naeem, and thank you so much for, for being here today. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nayamin Martinez. I am calling you from Jokuts, uh, uh, unceded Jokuts land, also known as Fresno County. We are in the heart of California, the Golden State. And sadly, I have to say that California, like many other parts of the country, are also looking at, at CCUS projects as a false solution to our climate change crisis. And I'm going to share with you some um, specific and concrete examples of how these projects are going to impact our communities here in the Central Valley of California, and so, but also some victories that uh, could be just got the number one in this year's report. So that's why CCS is so like unlikely, we don't want it because we already have the worst air quality in the nation. We have uh, some water contamination problems, et cetera. But in the community of Mendota uh, where the, one of these CCS proposed projects was happening, there are many other layers in why we are just um, more concerned than, than uh, in, in many other parts of the state. Uh, Mendota is a small rural community in the part of Fresno County. Most of the residents are farm workers, they're uninsured. And uh, it was caught up, it was brought to our attention by our colleagues at the Center for Ecological Diversity uh, in September of last year that Chevron and Clean Energy Systems had bought uh, a biomass facility that had been idle for nine years. At the time, this biomass facility, a uh, was uh, the worst uh, or the largest source of PM 2.5 in the entire county. So not only they are proposing to reopen the biomass, but also to add uh, the CCS component. And they're proposing to store underground the ca carbon. And that leads us to all the, uh, the you know, the, uh, the worries that we have. Mobile home park just half, half a mile away from where this facility is located. What are the threats if a leak happens? What is going to happen uh, in terms of uh, already Mendota has contaminated water? Is this going to exacerbate that contamination? And most importantly, if a leak happens, what is going to uh, who's going to take care of uh, this emergency situation? So that you know, Mendota doesn't have a hospital. The closest hospital is located 50 miles away, either in the city of Fresno or the city of uh, Madera. If our immigrants, uh, most of them are immigrants, the people who live in this mobile home park and in the Mendota in general, sure, farm workers, who's gonna pay for this? Is Chevron and Clean Energy gonna put a fund to protect these community members and attend this type of emergencies? And we, I'm talking not about hypothetical scenarios. Unfortunately, as we speak, my organization is bad combating a methane, massive methane leak in two abandoned wells in the city of Bakersfield. So it's not a, like if it would happen, we have ex real experiences of things uh, that go wrong in our communities. And the unresponsiveness of our regulatory agencies is, is you know, it's unbelievable. So that's why we don't want to be solving crisis. We want to prevent this crisis. That's why we went ahead and knocked the doors, canvassed all the mobile home park, and got the residents to sign on a letter that was sent to the EPA uh, general administrator because they had uh, they were about to uh, release the draft of the permit for this facility. So luckily, the applicant was to withdraw their application. So that's a win for us right now. But unfortunately, Mendota is just one of 17 proposed projects in California and 13 are located in the Central Valley. And we're doing everything that we can 
to exactly uh, to do what we did in Mendota, stop these projects. And we're also supporting legislation that will prevent that uh, CCS is used for enhanced oil recovery. A bill was just passed, uh, cleared the Senate uh, yesterday that will exactly do that. And I'm happy to share uh, more uh, details about other um, activities that we're doing um, in California to stop CCS in the Central Valley and in our state. And thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much, Naim. And I, you know, one of the things that that really struck me is that, you know, we often think about how these projects um, and the infrastructure that we put in communities can impact communities. But then, you know, you also brought up the point of like the lack of healthcare infrastructure and other things. And in many low-income uh, and immigrant communities and communities of color, they they not only are getting this infrastructure that harms them, but also receive a lot, don't have access to infrastructure that can actually help and support uh, communities when these disasters uh, arrive. And so thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, we're gonna take a little bit of time to do some uh, questions that we've received. If um, the panelists would like to uh, turn on their cameras and come on, um, you can feel free to do so. And um, the first question I'm actually gonna send over to um, uh, to, to Dr. Shetler and a question, um, is uh, can there be potential health effects um, after the CO2 is pumped deep underground? Um, or do we not need to worry about it after we get it to that point? No, we do need to worry about it after it's been put underground. Uh, and selecting the site is really important because uh, several things can happen. If the site is not well selected, uh, it can leak and um, it can leak both horizontally or vertically. It, the typical site would have a cap rock over the top of it, but if that cap rock breaks, uh, the CO2 will then uh, can migrate upwards. And if there are drinking water aquifers above the CO2 se sequestration site, the CO2 will get into the drinking water. And there, just as I described before, it will also form carbonic acid, which will then uh, enable uh, hazardous metals like lead and arsenic, for example, and even radionuclides to leach out of the surrounding rock into the drinking water. So then we can have uh, contaminated drinking water being brought to the surface. Uh, and then finally, depending on uh, where the CO2 is sequestered, uh, pu putting it in under pressure can cause earthquakes. And this has actually happened in a number of uh, places in the world, depending on the uh, geology. So there are several things that can happen and it needs to be monitored carefully uh, over many, many decades. This isn't just short-term monitoring. We're talking about watching this for a long time. Thank you, Dr. Shetler. Uh, Dr. Steingraber, um, could you say more about carbon, uh, about commercial carbon capture facilities operating in the U.S. and what they're used for? And you're on mute. I think we'd all know that by now. Okay, so there are about 27 um, commercial carbon capture and storage facilities operating around the world. And 12 of those are in the United States. And so of that dozen, um, four of them are used for natural gas processing. Three of them are used for ethanol production, three for fertilizer um, production, and one for synthesis gas production, one for hydrogen production. And so only one, which is in Illinois, the Illinois Industrial Carbon Capture and Storage Project actually stores the capture it carbons. It st stores the uh, carbon it captures. and um, and that uh, facility has consistently failed to reach its promised goal each year. So again, um, there are no utility scale carbon capture and storage projects that are operating in the United States. Um, and um, of the other ones, none of them are um, successfully cap capturing the promised amount of carbon. So there's just nothing we can point to to show that this actually works. Great, thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Steingraber. Um, uh, next question um, uh, for, for Sikawis. Um, can you speak a little bit to, um, you know, what actions the uh, tribes are, are planning to take moving forward uh, around these efforts? I can't speak about the actions of tribes. Um, they are all sovereign entities and, you um, making their own decisions uh, concerning uh, these pipelines. 
um, and that would be too large of a question for me to answer. Um, but you know, I do know that there are certain tribes right now that definitely aren't okay with this, um, and uh, we are in the process of uh, speaking to um, a few of them actually. Um, and uh, as an organization, uh, working with other grassroots uh, indigenous folks and uh, other uh, environmental organizations, uh, I can say that we do have a lot um, uh, planned um, and we have been doing a lot for a year and a half now, uh, I think about, about a year, over a year to year and a half. Uh, for instance, um, you know, we um, are doing just a lot of education along the route um, from, you know, Iowa up to uh, North Dakota, and um, uh, where we work very closely with the Science and Environmental Health uh, Network um, and other local organizations in Iowa. Um, and then also, we are advocating on behalf of BIPOC people in general um, within the state of Iowa and well throughout the whole route. Um, like I said, there are like urban centers that are not being considered at all uh, in these uh, right now in the talks and even uh, within the um, movement pushing back at this, um, where uh, you know we're not having the conversations with uh, Black communities, Latino, Latina communities about um, the effects that this will have if there's a pipeline leak. Thank you. Um, Naiman, um, a similar question for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, kind of what your communities, um, you know, have planned, what your community has planned going forward, um, you know, on fighting these projects and, and maybe, um, you know, a little bit about, is there anything that gives you hope uh, for, for the future? Sure. Well, um, I think that the, 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 the fact that we were able to stop that project, it had been the the EPA had been reviewing the application for 18 months. I was literally going to approve it back in February. Uh, we were able to uh, get the general administrator for Region 9, Martha Guzman, to come to Mendota to talk to residents to see by herself what was how close they were and what would the impacts be for these uh, community members. I think it's more difficult when you put a face. Uh, it's not only a paper, an application in, on your desk to, to have more conscious of how you are really reviewing these applications. And uh, that gave me hope. But we are not just limiting our, our efforts, just one project at a time. We're also, I was in a part of um, uh, this morning, a conversation with General Administrator Marta Guzman and the California Air Resources Board Agency uh, on how to be, bring together a symposium in California that can really discuss uh, what would be the guardrails that would be needed to protect fence line communities? We're supporting um, definitely a bills that uh, are going to put um, some of those guardrails, like the one that I mentioned, that will put a, uh, that would not allow if CCS are approved to be used for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, and lastly, the other thing that gave me hope is that just recently there was also a, another victory, a, a something that just happened yesterday. So it was the, the Natural Carbon Sequestration and Resilience Act, AB 2649, that advanced out of, the, out of the California State Assembly and is moving to the Senate. So we're really moving forward to push for this. We know that there are other ways to sequester carbon. We know we need to sequester carbon, but we need to do it the right way. And those are the things that we're doing at the state level, but also at the local level, so that uh, it's not one project at a time, but also systemic. Uh, policies and, and practices and regulations that could be put in place to protect our residents. Thank you very much, Naiman. Um, Stephen, you had mentioned an energy penalty during your talk. Someone asked um, if you could explain um, what that energy penalty is. And also, are you able to capture the CO2 that we generated from the energy penalty in the same way you would capture it from uh, another, uh, you know, from the original facility without receiving another energy penalty? Right. That's a, a great pair of questions. Um, so the energy penalty is literally just the energy that is required to run the carbon capture operation, the capture and actually the compression. Um, it involves, I won't go through the whole process, but basically the, the solvents and the heating, and, and it just, it requires a lot of energy. And then also, you know, compressing the CO2 to its supercritical state so you can move it. Um, 
there are different ways to set up these facilities. So the two coal-fired power plants in North America that had CCS on them, one of them, uh, Petronova, built a separate gas-fired power plant on site. And so there, you know, if you wanted to try to capture those emissions, you need to daisy chain another CCS unit and et cetera, et cetera. Boundary Dam um, had a unified system. So it's just the coal plant is now burning more coal than it used to, but putting out less power. But there, the entirety of the emission stack is subject to carbon capture. But again, there, I forget the exact number. I don't have it pulled up, but it is capturing on the order of half or less than half of the uh, CO2 it's emitting, um, accounting for even that extra energy penalty. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you to all of our panelists for uh, being here today and for all the congressional staff who took time out of their schedule to, to join us. Um, you know, we uh, see this uh, effort uh, moving forward in um, really in the hands of Congress. Uh, these harms that we discussed today will only be allowed to happen if uh, members of Congress um, wind up putting forward resources for the uh, development of, of carbon capture infrastructure and, and hydrogen infrastructure. And so, um, you know, we urge you to, to continue, uh, those of you to, who have been helping us to fight against this, to continue uh, pushing against this and pushing for real climate solutions. And those who are um, learning more about this, we urge you to um, take this information back to your boss and, 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 and urge them to, to be as strong against this as some of the other members are as well. So thank you all very much, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you all uh, in the future. Take care. Bye now.